I think we're ready to begin. So I would like to call the meeting of March 21st of the San Carlos Planning Commission to order. And we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance, Pledge of allegiance flag, flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, 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 to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, under God, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Garvey. Present. And as I noted before, but just for the record, Commissioner Yacoponi is excused and absent this evening. Commissioner Bradley. Uh, present, and I was present uh, another, another time where I was marked absent again. Like that. Okay, we'll, we'll get to the minutes and make sure that we get you down for the for the meeting then. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Vice Chair Clements? Present. And Chair Roof? Present. So uh, we want to change the um, order if there are no objections from the other commissioner that the order of the agenda items uh, because um, because Lisa Porras will be presenting item number um, 7A, which is the um, housing update, um, has to leave the meeting early. So we'd like to get her in at the, at, towards the beginning. So we'll go item 5, followed by 7A, and then to 6. Okay. So no, there are no, um, no objections. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So Thank you. I five, appreciate uh, that. We'll do um, we'll do the approval of the, of the um, I guess we'll do the the general public comment, the approval of the minutes, and then we'll um, and then we'll do the um, housing update before we get into the um, public hearing. And so the the next item on the agenda is is the um, public comment. And so th this is public comment is limited to items that are not on the agenda. And the commission may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed as allowed by the Brown Act, Government Code Section 54954.2. However, the commission's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have a matter placed on a future commission agenda for a more comprehensive action or a report. So we'd like to know if there's anybody uh, on the on the Zoom call or on the phone um, who wants to make a public comment regarding an item that is not one of our agenda topics tonight. Uh, Sarah or Dara, I'm not sure who's, who's at the controls tonight. Uh, this is Dara. Is there Dara, wonderful. Uh, Dara, is there anyone in the waiting room for the um, public comment? There are no raised hands at this time. Okay, then we'll... Um, We'll move on to the next um, topic, which is the now, oh, the, the approval of the minutes. Um, and so um, we want need to approve uh, the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting of February 22nd and approve the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting of March 7th. Do any commissioners have um, comments on those minutes? And um, before we forget, let's register Commissioner Bradley's earlier comment about the attendance. Which meeting was that? Uh, gosh, I don't have it in front of me. I think it was the last one. It's the only one in six years I've been absent. Okay. I think it was the last one or certainly maybe the one before that. Absent. And okay. Turn the page over, you'll see that I spoke and I asked questions and mm -hmm. made motions. Absolutely. So we'll get. Um, I did, I did miss the pledge of allegiance, though. <laughs> okay. But um, I do that in a military organization. Excellent. I think we got, captured that one. And um, I see Vice Chair Vice Chair Chris Clements. Do you have a uh, comment? Thanks, Chair. I was, um, I needed to make a couple of corrections to the minutes from the discussion of the billboard. So um, I also don't have that pulled up in front of me at the moment. Um, was that February 22nd then or 3-7? I think it was 3-7. 
Yeah, that was our last meeting. But, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I have three corrections on page two, the second paragraph from the bottom. Uh, the I think the statement needs to read that the lease is not within the authority of the planning commission rather than what it states there, which is the council, which of course it is, I think, in the authority of the council. So that's the first correction. The second, uh, on page three, the second paragraph regarding the lease agreement, um, one of the comments that I had made did not make the minutes, so I was um, hoping that it could be added, um, that if you could add that I was surprised that the applicant could convey land control to the city and that this would qualify as leasing of city owned land or city land. And then one last line, I'm trying to decipher my notes, sorry, just a second. Um, on page three, the third line from the, oh, the third paragraph from the bottom, the last line. Oh, I think my comment was that the council should also set guidelines that would pertain to lease renewals and terminations. And then re-examine the business terms. Because that sounds like now the renewal was at the sole option of the applicant. So my comment was that the council could develop guidelines for lease renewals and terminations and then re-examine the terms of the business terms so that the, the renewal was not solely at the election of the applicant. So those were my comments. Does staff need any further clarification or I could send an email separately? Um, we got those and we'll listen to the recording and make sure those are reflected. And this would be in the minutes of February 22nd. That's right. I, I said the 7th. But this be okay, and I wrote the 7th, so sorry about that. Yeah, Thank you. This is the, the, electronic, the electronic billboard, correct? Yes. Correct. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Comments, other comments on the minutes? Move we'll hear. we approve mm -hmm. the minutes as corrected. I'll second that motion. We have a motion. Yeah, a motion and a second? Oh, uh, through the, Yeah, through the chair, I just want to confirm this is a motion for February 22nd, and then we'll do another motion for the next set of minutes, correct? That's what I would recommend. Yes, that's totally correct. Okay, uh, great. <laughs> so, so I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the planning commission meeting of February 22nd. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Garvey? I will abstain as I was not at this meeting. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Iacoponi is absent. Commissioner Bradley? Uh, yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Roof? Yes. And before we, I'd just like to confirm whether there are any comments regarding the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting on March 7th. That was also a signed topic, uh, but not for the billboard, but for the El Camino Real. Well, hearing no comments, uh, I would entertain a motion. I will move approval of the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting of March 7th, 2022. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? I will abstain because I was absent from that meeting. Mm -hmm. And Chair Roof? Yes. Okay. Next item on the agenda is a presentation on the housing element progress report. Um, and this um, 
staff recommends that the Planning Commission receive a, a presentation on the City of San Carlos 2021 Housing Element and Wolf Progress Report. So there'll be no motion on our part. This is for, for informational and uh, both we and the public can make comments. Presentation. Thank you, Chair Roof. Good evening, um, Chair and Planning Commissioners. Lisa Porras, Planning Manager, and I will be making the presentation on this item this evening. Again, this is a yearly annual progress report that is required by the State Department of Housing and Community Development in terms of reporting the progress of the adopted 2015 housing element. And this item involves reporting for the calendar year of 2021. And so the um, requirements for the housing element annual progress report in terms of what is required to be reported upon are set by the state. And um, there is a typo on this slide. It's January 21st, 2022 through December 31, 2022. Um, so apologies for that error. I just wanted to clarify the year that we're reporting on. So there's essentially 10 items that we're required to report on. Not all of them um, pertain to the city of San Carlos in terms of what we needed to do to meet um, our regional housing needs allocation that was assigned to us back then. Um, but there are um, um, some essential ones that um, that we are will be reporting on that's part of this report and what's in the packet. Um, the first is the development um, activity um, in the year 2022. Um, again, there's another typo, apologies for that. Um, we've used this presentation before, so sometimes some of the um, past dates get, don't get updated. Um, so we need to report on the applications that have been deemed complete in the year 2021. Um, we also need to describe the building permit activity, um, what's been entitled, what permits have been issued, um, how many certificate of occupancies have been issued for uh, net new housing units. We also need to identify um, our progress in meeting the RENA. And this is um, identified by um, the permits issued under which affordability categories. We also need to identify whether there have been any sites um, rezoned to accommodate our shortfall housing need. And for San Carlos in the year 2015, there wasn't a big heavy lift that we needed to do, which is unlike what we're doing currently for our uh, 2,735 units that we're planning for today. But back then there wasn't any need to um, rezone uh, sites to accom accommodate any shortfall back then. But if we had, we would need to report on it. So this is a standard template that every city in the state uses to report on its housing element progress. We also need to identify um, what programs, um, where certain programs are, you know, what their status is. Some of them are ongoing. Um, some of them include financial contributions. So they're all listed in the report. Um, the next item is for commercial development um, bonuses that have been approved. Um, this is for projects that are um, on commercial sites, but that include an affor affordable housing component um, the city did not have any projects of this type. We also need to report on any units that have been rehabilitated, preserved, or acquired um, as part of um, our housing element program, and whether any locally owned lands have been, um, you know, sold, leased, or disposed of, or declared as surplus. And then we also finally need to report on our LEAP grant reporting um, component. So for the year 2021, what happened in the city of San Carlos? And again, um, in terms of RENA, what we can count is um, what's been issued building permits. But in terms of overall um, activity, there were 41 units that were um, deemed complete and then approved that received planning entitlements. And then um, 47 uh, net new units received building permits. And those consisted of nine apartments at 530 Walnut, eight condos at 1240 El Camino Real, in which case that project included one uh, moderate below market rate unit, seven net new single unit homes, and then 23 accessory dwelling units. So for this period, we can count a total of 47 net new units in 2021 towards our arena progress. So just as a reminder, um, what was our, our regional housing needs allocation requirement back in 2020, 2015? Um, we had a requirement for 195 very low-income units, 107 low-income units, 111 moderate units, 
and then 183 units above moderate for a total of 596 units. So this slide here shows our progress since the year 2015 um, through the year 2021, just last year. And as you can see on the screen, the year where we had kind of the, the largest amount of um, building permits issued for net new units in the city was the year 2016. These were comprised by um, the Transit Village Project and also Wheeler Plaza downtown. And then um, the units, um, you know, kind of sort of level to where we have seen them before. Um, so where we are today is we have issued a, a total of um, permits to construct um, a net new of 622 units in the city. However, a majority of those, as you can see on the slide here, are in the above moder moderate or market rate category. We still have 363 units um, to meet our regional housing needs allocation. And I would want to clarify um, this component of um, meeting our, our regional housing needs allocation. Um, it's definitely a priority of the city, and we have many programs and are currently looking at mechanisms to facilitate the production of affordable housing. Um, that's our, and that's our primary role. Um, we're not in the um, developer um, kind of business where the city actively goes out and constructs new units. However, we do partner with nonprofits as we've seen recently um, at the 817 Walnut Project. However, what our job um, really is here at the city is to make sure that we have the appropriate zoning in place and that we have programs um, in place to uh, facilitate housing and that we take a look at our zoning uh, standards to make sure that we're not unduly constraining development activity. So what I would like to just share, and I know the commission is aware of this, but just as a reminder, because if we think about just the one moderate unit that received a building permit last year, it seems um, kind of like a little bit daunting, but it really just depends when these units come online to receive their building permit. But other efforts underway, as the commission is aware of, is our below market rate ordinance update. Um, as the commission um, recalls, we had a study session um, before you not that long ago and then recently the city council um, had a study session that they held to kind of look at um, the proposals coming forth as part of this below market rate um, update. So for the rental development projects, you recall that currently the requirement is 15% of the units. Whenever there's a project that is seven units or more, then 15% of those units need to be affordable. And then of the 15%, there's a certain percentage for very low and then another percentage for low. And with the below market rate ordinance, the commission will recall that um, no changes are being recommended to the rental um, development projects because of feasibility concerns. However, with ownership developments, the current 15% uh, is being recommended to increase to a 20% in all low income category with the threshold for the affordable requirement um, being lowered from seven to five units. Um, so this is one thing that we're currently working on. In terms of development applications um, at various stages in the um, entitlement process, we have about 62 uh, net new affordable units pending. Um, we have um, building permits pending at 560 and 626 Walnut. Um, in the planning stages for a new 100% affordable housing project at 100, excuse me, at 1232 Cherry Street, where we uh, foresee about 30 units, maybe a little bit more, um, at all low-income categories. An additional unit um, coming online uh, as part of 1257 Magnolia. And then with 808 Alameda de las Pulgas and 155-160 Vista del Grande um, townhome projects, we see um, another grouping of low market rate units coming online from those projects. And then at 308 Phelps Road, which is still under review, um, this is a project that would include net new nine single unit homes. Some of those will include um, accessory dwelling units and there will be at least one below market rate unit. And then just as a reminder, um, some projects that have already been counted towards the arena, but that are very near um, in terms of being completed with low income units coming online include 1525 San Carlos where there will be three affordable units, 1501 Cherry with four affordable units, and then 17 Walnut with 23 units that are all low income or, or below. 
In terms of the programs that the city has in its housing element, we have essentially seven different categories. And um, there's quite a bit in your packet. Um, and they've been there, you know, since 2015. And these generally um, have pretty much stayed the same. A lot of them we've completed. Some of them um, we continue to um, provide financial contribution contributions toward, and some of them are underway, but they all fall in um, seven general categories that promote um, preservation of the housing that we currently have, um, programs to promote energy efficiency in housing, um, policies that encourage housing close to transit, promoting second units. Um, in 2015, um, the, um, the environment was very different than it is now with accessory dwelling units. So we've completed a lot of updates to our accessory dwelling unit, um, encouraging um, uh, programs. And then um, programs that assist in the development of affordable housing, looking at things that we can do to remove government constraints, and then programs to address special needs. In terms of um, what's going on now for our current housing element update, the commission will recall that we're planning for um, over 2,000 net new units in the city to the year 2031. We've completed um, a lot of workshops with the community that started back in November of 2020 and um, concluded in 2021. We have worked with the community to identify solutions to meet this arena, which is going to include this time an upzoning to different zoning districts, including height increases. And where we're at now is that we're currently drafting um, the policy documents, the land use and house, housing and safety elements. And we're going to be targeting bringing those forward to the commission in May of this year. And then later in the summer, we would go. We would be going before the state Department of Housing and Community Development to review our housing element, which is required. It's a required part of the process, with adoption um, in the fall of this year, in time to meet state certification uh, by January 2023. So this concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you have. Thank you. There are clarifying questions from the commissioners. Well, let's um, let's open for public comment if there are public comment on this. Maybe, thank you. Um, if you would like to make a public comment on agenda item 7A, housing element annual progress report, now is the time to speak. You can join the Zoom meeting or call the phone number and enter the meeting ID and raise your hand on Zoom or press star nine, um, then star six to unmute if you're on the phone. And we ask for two minutes per caller and if you could give your name. Um, Dara, is there anyone in the waiting room for comment on this topic? Yes, David Tuzman has their hand raised. David, I have allowed you to talk and you have two minutes to speak. Hello. Uh, uh, thanks for the presentation. I just had one question of uh, when do we expect the housing site inventory list to be or some draft of it to be available to the public for the new cycle? That's it. Thanks. We'll, we'll, we'll try to get that information brought out at some point. Thank you for your comment. Um, Dara, is there anyone else in the waiting room for public comment? There are no other commenters. Okay, if there are no additional public comments for this topic, um, uh, I guess we need a motion to close the public um, comment section. Is that correct? Lisa, you're on. Your you don't. You don't need to. Because oh, don't need. Okay. It's technically not a public hearing item, but it's right. Oh, yes, that's right. And, and and through the chair, if you'd like, I could answer that question for the in terms of when uh, the site's inventory will be uh, made available. Um, we are are I, we are currently working on establishing something that's um, kind of in a in a format to be presented to the public. But essentially, um, through the notice of preparation process, the NOP that we currently have on the website, there are sites that have been identified um, for upzoning, and those would essentially um, comprise our site's inventory. 
But what we're doing is we're taking all of those parcels and addresses and we're putting to them together in a table. And those would be part of um, the information that goes out to the Public and Planning Commission in time for your uh, May 16th meeting. But in the interim, one could always look at the maps on the um, on the website. And if anybody has any question about a, about a particular site, um, they can contact me um, through email or by phone, and we can I can verify whether a site is or or is not um, on the inventory. Okay, thank you. Is there any comment or discussion from planning commissioners? Uh, just a kind of a broad question are are we incorporating uh, strategy to this like uh, so many ADUs and Bay ADUs how many lot splits placed on a lot split are we getting that detailed do we have to Uh, Commissioner Bradley, um, in terms of ADUs, um, this is something um, that we are internally tracking um, just to kind of see our progress made on basically as a result of the new state laws. Um, and, and yes, um, with, the, um, with the inventory, with the uh, spreadsheets and the data that's required by the state, they do require that we identify whether a net new unit is a multifamily project, whether it's a single unit or whether it's an ADU. So those are act absolutely being tracked by the state. And in terms of lot splits, um, the state isn't really tracking those per se, but if we do have projects where there was one lot and divided by two, and then we have two uh, new units on that, those are um, our inputs into the spreadsheet. So they, are, so they are reflected, but not necessarily categorized, categorized by a lot split. You see, thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, avoid extra work and also some assumptions made in all clarity, but um, really reflect what our general plan do in terms of land uses. Thank you. Uh, Satisfies my question. Very good. Okay. Thank. Thank you, uh, Vice Vice Chair Clements. Comment. Thanks, Chair. I have a question and then a comment. Um, my question for staff is that for moderate income units, has staff looked at um, alternative ways to get credit for the units? So. Um, in other words, the state lets you calculate to see if housing prices are in the moderate income range for your area and that um, recorded restrictions aren't necessarily required for moderate income. And I'm wondering if staff had looked at this as another way to get credit for moderate income. Um, I don't know if the math works in San Carlos, if any units are coming out of the ground in the moderate income range here, but I wanted to ask that. Uh, I don't believe so. I mean, that's something that I would need to check um, with my colleagues. I don't know if we've done any type of um, kind of evaluation or screening in that regard, um, but that is something, you know, that we can definitely take a look at and see if there's any way, you know, whatever ways that we, whatever is available that we can do, we want to make sure to look at it. And um, so thank you for drawing our attention to that. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, and, and along those lines, and um, I know San Jose does that, um, created its own methodology. And basically the state, if it, if you create a credible methodology and it kind of holds together, um, you know, San Jose hasn't gotten any questions on the methodology and um, have given it some thought. So I'm happy to help provide that to you if, if it's interesting. Um, the other thing I'd point out is that the a bill just passed last year as to the new product that um, some joint powers authorities 
can offer where an existing build, they're using it for existing buildings, can be acquired and then income restricted. Um, that's now eligible. That little product is now eligible. There's probably going to be more legislation this session on it, but um, that might be another way to get some mod units created. My comment is that to someone who's used to much larger numbers than this than these rena goals, um, I am sad that our number of ELI plus VLI is only 22 in several years through this period. And, you know, the, I would just urge staff to um, focus as hard as possible on getting some more deeply subsidized units to happen. So um, I guess one more question I could have asked when chair asked for clarifying questions. Could you um, review again the the BMR ordinance um, and what it, not that it would reach to ELI, BLI, but the, um, the proposed ideas about amending the ordinance and the timeline for that? Oh, certainly. Um, the next steps are that it would go to city council. Um, in speaking with my colleague, Adam Aronson, who is here to present the update um, to provide you know, the presentation for the Planning Commission study session, um, we, he recently took um, the item to city council and um, it is now being um, you know, prepared to be brought forward for okay. adoption. So it would come back um, very soon to the Planning Commission for a recommendation and then to city council. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And I know um, it's uh, terrific that you all are looking at the ordinance again to see what's feasible at this time in the market. So I think that's wonderful. But I know that there's no way around subsidizing um, to get down to the ELI and BLI rents. And, and so, um, you know, of all of the city priorities, I know affordable housing is one of the top ones, but I really strongly urge the city to continue to focus on this because these numbers are not good. Thank you. Any additional comments from planning commissioners? Well, I, I had one perhaps clarification for the uh, May 16th meeting. What would the scope of that topic be? And, and the second part of this is, can the materials for it, at least some of them, be available um, ahead of time uh, so that we have a, more time to study them? Absolutely. Um, certainly, that's a big item um, on the agenda. It would be a study session, so there's a no formal recommendation. But the May 16th, 16th meeting would be a study session where staff and the consultant team would be presenting the, the proposed draft land use, housing, and safety elements plus the accompanying zoning. So we would be looking at all of these together um, in one study session. Um, and again, there would be no recommendation. We're looking for your comments. So what these documents uh, will include will be the draft policy language. So the goals, policies, action items, um, and also um, zoning uh, text amendments for how we're going to accommodate um, you know, our arena. And one of the things that we're doing as part of our project here is we're we're kind of we're doing it all at once. We're not adopting our policy documents and then going back um, to update our zoning. We're doing it all together because we know we need to because the arena allocation for this particular cycle is obviously quite significant, much higher than we've ever seen. And it's not just for us, but for all cities. So a lot of cities are currently um, using a strategy to kind of get their zoning adopted along with the policy document. So it's done. So um, we'll be taking a look at that uh, May 16th. And that's that's our target date to bring it to you. So it's kind of a big lift. And I hear you. And it makes a lot of sense um, to get the, what we can out early rather than, you know, like the weekend before. So we definitely won't be doing that. We'll make sure to get that out um, much um much ahead of time so that you have a chance to go through that. And we'll, it'll all be available on the website as well for the public. Excellent. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from commissioners on this topic? 
Well, hearing none, let's move on to our next topic. Thank you very much, Lisa. You're welcome. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And Andrea is going to take over the controls for the second part of the meeting. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thank Lisa. you. Okay. Okay, the next part of our meeting is the uh, public hearing. And the procedure for a public hearing is that staff will present a report on the history, physical features, et cetera, on the application, followed with the staff's recommendations. The applicant will make a presentation. Thereafter, interested members of the community may speak on the proposal. When all interested parties have had an opportunity to be heard, the hearing will be closed and no further discussion from the floor can be held. The commission will then consider the evidence and make its recommendation. If you challenge a public hearing item in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described in this notice, the public notice or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Speakers should state their name prior to addressing the commission. This will help the staff in preparing minutes. So the first public hearing item is 380 Industrial Road, APN 0460543390. And that's a request for approval of a conditional use permit to allow a large scale commercial entertainment and recreation land use and a transportation demand management plan in the IL zoning district uh, for the proposed business Auto Vino. Staff, would you like to give your presentation? Yes, good evening, commissioners and chair roof. My name is Sarah Cadona, contract assistant planner with the city of San Carlos. And the item before you is a request for approval of a conditional use permit to allow a large scale commercial entertainment and recreation land use and the transportation demand management plan in the light industrial zoning district for the proposed business Autovino. The site is in the light industrial zoning district with Holly Street located to the south, the Palo Alto Medical Foundation located to the east, the Greater East San Carlos Residential Neighborhood to the west, and 360 Industrial, formerly occupied by OSH, to the north. Auto Vino is proposed to be the only tenant within this 14,740 square foot building. The land use designation is planned industrial according to the land use element in the general plan. And the previous use of the site was warehouse, storage, and manufacturing. Autovino is proposed to occupy the building with car storage, wine production, and wine storage, all of which are permitted uses within the light industrial zoning district. And the applicant is proposing wine tasting, outdoor dining, and indoor and outdoor event space, which requires approval of a conditional use permit. Autovino's proposed hours of operation are as follows. So they'll be open to the general public for wine tasting and outdoor dining Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday from noon to 4 p.m. They will also be open Monday through Friday from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. for corporate and private events where they will be able to utilize the indoor and outdoor facilities. These events will be between 35 and 40 people and there will be no amplified sounds allowed. And everything will be completely shut down by 10 p.m. in respect to the neighboring residential neighborhood. Here is the site plan. The applicant is not proposing any changes to the existing building at this time. And there is an existing shared parking lot between the two buildings of 360 and 380 industrial. And there's a total of 219 parking spaces. 71 of those are designated to the tenant at 380 Industrial. And the applicant is requesting approval for a permanent outdoor dining and event area, which is outlined in blue. And it is proposed to be, it is proposed to occupy 13 of the 71 parking spaces, leaving 58 parking spaces available for the entire building at 380 Industrial. Here is the building's floor plan. As you can see, most of the space, which is outlined in orange, will be occupied by high-end luxurious cars. 
And the area to the left of the cars is where wine production and wine storage will occur. And the green outlined area is where the designated wine tasting and indoor event area will be. On, and on packet page 15 of the staff report, it outlines the square footage breakdown by each use. <clears throat> And this is the floor plan of the proposed outdoor dining and event space. The applicant is proposing to occupy 13 parking spaces. And within these spaces, there will be two trailers, a vintage food bus and a pizza oven. And located in the middle will be tables and chairs for guests to sit and dine. And surrounding the enclosed area, there will be 19 wine barrel landscaping planters. Here is the parking breakdown of the required number of spaces by use. A TDM is required due to the newly proposed use increasing the average daily trips by more than 10%. And with the implementation of a TDM plan, it is anticipated that it will reduce the number of trips by 20%. And the required number of parking spaces went from 36 spaces to 29 parking spaces. And as mentioned before, the applicant has 58 parking spaces available, excluding the 13 spaces for the permanent outdoor dining and event area. And staff finds that the applicant is sufficiently meeting their parking requirements. The TDM plan was prepared by Hexagon Transportation Consultants on February 3rd, 2022, which anticipates a 20% 20, 20 reduction in vehicle trips by using the following measures, which are a new employee orientation welcome packet, um, a transportation kiosk, carpool and vanpool parking and incentives, long-term and short-term bicycle parking, and subsidized transit passes with the options of one of the following, which are Caltrain Go Pass, Sam Trans way to go program or re reimbursement on travel expenses and also participation in future transportation management association. The applicant mailed their business proposal site plan and floor plan to all property owners and occupants within a 300 foot radius of the site inviting them to attend a neighborhood meeting that was held on December 2nd, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. One neighbor from the greater East San Carlos residential neighborhood attended the meeting showing support of the project and was excited about a business like this coming into the neighborhood. And on March 7th, 2022, staff mailed public noticing to all property owners and occupants within a 300 foot radius and since, staff has received no comments or concerns about the project. Um, here is the motion, and I would also like to make a note that there was a mistake in the staff report's motion, and the motion that should be read into the record is the motion that is on the presentation slide. And staff, as well as the applicant, are here to answer any questions that the commission may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, are there clarifying questions from the planning commissioners before we open for public comment? I just need to say that um, I went to visit the site on my own uh, just today and did talk with a couple of fellows that are working on the project and involved in it, and they answered questions, so I... I of concern about those, and uh, I'm excited about it. Like the like the uh, resident um, organization fellow said, uh, it are really looks great. If you like uh, multi-million dollar Italian cars and uh, pizza and wine, this is the place <laughs> to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Radley. Commissioner Commissioner Garvey. Uh, thank you, Chair Roof, and I will echo uh, Commissioner Bradley's comment. This is a 
a lively and fun addition to a, a new part of San Carlos that normally doesn't have that. And so I think it's it's a nice addition. My, I had two general comments, maybe questions about the transportation demand management plan. Two things jumped out at me that were incentives. And I was curious as to how long these incentives uh, have been in place. Uh, the first one was um, Star Store, our, our partners at Commute Dog, org. If you travel to and from San Mateo County on tra on transit, you can earn points on something called a star platform, and then you can redeem these points for stuff. And you know, there's many people who don't get out of their cars and don't take transit. They just need a little bit of a nudge. So a, a real shout out to whoever thought of this great idea to give points and then you can redeem them because it just might be enough to nudge someone into doing it. And, and the second one is the, the van pool participant rebates. They will pay half of the van pool recipients fare up to $100 a month for a total of $500. Well, this is another fabulous incentive to just get folks who might not be thinking about it thinking about it and maybe doing it. And then once they do it, maybe they'll do it for a longer period of time. I was curious, Sarah, how long have these incentive programs been in place? Are these new and I just haven't really called them out before or have these been around for a while? They're great ideas. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long these programs have been within commute.org, but I do know that commute.org is always trying to find new incentives and in programs and they might have more information on their website but Andrea if you maybe had any more information on commute.org I actually don't have any additional information no. well I'm glad we're talking about this tonight it's just I just wanted to call out these I think commute.org is real is really doing just as you say they're trying to think of new ideas for people that are on the fence and to incentivize them. And I thought these were both really fabulous ideas. And, and if they're around in our TDM for this project, I have a feeling they may be around in future TDMs for future projects. And, and I think that's a great idea. Thank and, you. And through the chair, if the commission is interested, um, that is information we could gather and, and give to you as an informational item in the future, if you'd like to know more about um, their programs. I think I'm okay. I'll go to the website and, and I and I think I can probably learn more there. Thank you. Any additional clarifying questions before we open for public comment? Let's move to public comment. If you would like to make a public comment on agenda item 6A, 380 Industrial Road, Otto Vino, now is the time to speak. You can join the meeting on Zoom. Um, or you can call the phone number, and if you're calling on the phone, press star nine and star six to unmute. And uh, Dara, is there anyone in the waiting room to speak on this item? Yes, we have Tim Ryan. Tim, I have allowed you to speak, um, and you have two minutes. Well, Cameron, thank you very much. Uh, hello, commissioners. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Uh, Tim Ryan, 339 Fairfield Drive. Uh, probably just, um, I don't know, my guess is a couple of hundred feet from Otto Vino. Uh, I, I visited them uh, at this current location several times at their old location in Menlo Park. And I think it's just very exciting to have them in the neighborhood. Uh, super fun people, Phil, Inga, Buff, their dog, Daisy. Uh, last couple of visits, I've, I've spoken with Brian, who makes their wine. Their wine is excellent. Their food is excellent. This side of San Carlos, the east side of San Carlos, is going to, I think, you know, by the end of this decade, just explode in job growth. We need a lot of venues. We're going to need many more venues to try to keep these workers in San Carlos, you know, once they uh, clock off at, at 5 p.m. So, this place is, is is fun. The cars are out, just outstanding. I mean, I'm not a car guy, but to watch uh, those cars roll into my neighborhood, I mean, 
crazy fun cars. Uh, it's really exciting. I mean, I was sorry th- to see Osh go. Uh, it, this is an old neighborhood. And Lord knows we all need hardware stores close by. But to have this in the neighborhood uh, is, is really exciting. Uh, the only thing that I would add is, is that in Menlo Park, they had the big white tent. And I was able to sit under that tent, eat their great pizza, unbelievable sandwiches. And I like the tent because I'm an old guy. I can't take too much sun. It's a black top parking lot. Uh, Osh never even came close to filling all of the spots in that parking lot. There's plenty of room for a tent. So please welcome Auto Vino approved the tent for guys like me that can't take too much sunshine and continue to emphasize the planned growth of East San Carlos. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Dara, is there anyone else in the waiting room for this item? Yes, we have Angela. Angela, I have allowed you to speak and you have two minutes. Hi there. Uh, Angela and Ed Sterling, uh, 984 Sylvan Drive, uh, just across the street from Fairfield and uh, the new Auto Vino uh, facility. We think it's a great idea. We're totally uh, on board and really excited to uh, have an establishment that's going to have some pretty cool cars, some entertainment, and definitely some wine tasting in the neighborhood. Uh, it's going to be a little uh, zest of life that it needs. So uh, we're glad that you guys are uh, entertaining the idea and supporting uh, their business. Thank you. Thank you. Dara, is there anyone else in the waiting room? Yes, we have Shuri. Shuri, I have allowed you to talk and you have two minutes. Surely we don't hear you. Are you on mute? I'm so sorry about that. You must now we hear you. Unmuted, unmuted myself. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, we, uh, my husband and I, reside on Sylvan Drive, and we are welcoming Auto Vino into the neighborhood. We think it would be a very fun adventure, a fun company to have in the neighborhood. As classic car fans ourselves and avid wine drinkers. We think this would be a great addition to the area and to locale, and it'd be something fun to do on the weekends. I would also like to, and as a side note, um, commend Ms. Condona on an excellent, well-thought-out presentation. So, thank you. Thank you. Dara, anyone else in the waiting room? We have Marie King. Marie, I have allowed you to speak, and you have two minutes. Hello, um, this is Marie King and my husband, Clarence Johnson, a, another family living on Sylvan Drive in very close proximity to this um, new company. We are also excited as we are wine fanatics and auto lovers. And we also think this is something that's been needed in San Carlos for, for a long time, you know, we don't have very many new type of um, entities showing up like this in our town. While we don't like all the building that's going on, this is something that we ourselves feel that we would visit and um, be uh, thoroughly entertained and could spend time with our current neighbors or even meet a lot of our uh, other neighbors that we haven't been able to meet as of yet, you know, in other uh, blocks. Um, we have lived in this city for over 33 years, so we're excited about this new entrance. The only thing I ask is that we do keep a focus on the noise level and making sure that it does uh, shut off at 10, 8, 10 p.m. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your comment. Dara, anyone else? There are no callers at this time. And. I, I forgot to ask, did the applicant um, want to, are they present and did they want to make a comment? Uh, yes, this is uh, Phil Gerlani and Bill Hagman is our architect. Um, 
I'm with Otto Vino. Uh, it's, uh, my father and I started the business about 15 years ago uh, in Menlo Park. Uh, unfortunately, we were um, overwhelmed by Facebook, took over the our area that we were in. So we've been looking for a new space for boy, four or five years now and uh, came across this and I think we lucked out with the perfect uh, location. And we're excited to, to get open and start meeting our neighbors and uh, and start doing business in San Carlos. Okay, thank you. Sarah, has anyone else popped up for public comment? There are no callers at this time. Okay, if, if, since there are no more callers, I would entertain a motion to um, close the uh, public comment period. Chair, I'll move that the public comment period be closed. I'll second that. The motion and a second. Can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. Okay, we're now in the commissioner discussion and uh, uh, Vice, Vice Chair Clements, would you have a comment? Thank you, yes. Um, well, I have to say that to have three residents that will live near this uh, proposed project to all be in favor of the proposed project, um, I think speaks volumes to the um, excitement <laughs> Uh, in the community for a different kind of use of this space. Um, you know, a lot of times it's hard to figure out how to reuse larger spaces. And um, I was um, pretty excited when I read the staff report and then I went on Yelp and I couldn't believe how positive the Yelp reviews were of this business. <laughs> um, and so to hear that, uh, and I also noticed, by the way, that the applicant, hello, um, had already changed his address on Yelp to San Carlos. Like he sound, you know, they sound excited about being in San Carlos. Um, so I, uh, I, I was, uh, I was impressed by the enthusiasm and, um, felt like the staff analysis was pretty clear and pretty cut and dried, that all the findings were made, that it's an appropriate use for the space, and um, that, th that the hours of operation and noise were very contained, um, and that bottling, what was it, twice a year, really did not seem to be any kind of impact on the neighborhood, um, potentially around the neighbors. And so um, I thought this was a pretty a simple decision, and I was... Um, Looking forward already to my first visit. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Commissioner Garvey. Well, thank you, Chair Roof. I'll, I'll echo the comments of my colleagues. This is a, a vibrant and fun use of this property in an area of town that doesn't have this kind of use. And I'm very excited to uh, drive my super boring car to one of the events here one day and um, and check it out. I I liked reading through the transportation demand management plan and particularly want to call out again the two um, strong and forward looking incentives in there for van pools and um, transit reimbursements and points. I thought those were really um, not forward thinking new ideas and I wanted to call them out. And I think as uh, one of the commenters said, it's a great venue for corporate events, and there's going to be a lot of Class A office down in that region. There already is some now, and I think that's a great use for that space, not only for uh, folks like me, but for corporate events. So uh, I think it's a great project. So Thank when you. I read the project, I, I didn't uh, notice, but when I was there today, to the west, there's a nice green grassy hill to view. Uh, nice setting for outdoor dining or wine tasting. Across the other way is PAMP, the uh, medical. was going to be a hospital, but now it's a nice clinic that a lot of us go to. Um, and that's right across the street. So some of them can, I always wondered where those docs and nurses at lunch, you know, here they can walk right across the street and have a good meal. Uh, it's just, uh, I support the project. It's uh, exciting uh, to have something like this here. I, I love cars. I thought I had a couple of interesting, valuable ones, but when I saw what they had, it's um, breathtaking. Owe it to yourself to go see them. 
Thank you. And I'll jump in with my comment, which I also had a chance to um, to visit the site. And um, I feel like the outdoor entertainment area is um, attractive and, and consistent with the um, the land use designation there and uh, shouldn't be a problem for the neighbors as long as the rules are adhered to. So um, it looks entirely appropriate to me. And I think it's a interesting and creative idea. I'm definitely going to go check it out. So um, uh, I think we're all excited. Are we ready for a, um, uh, uh, to bring up the, um, the motion, the motion? Have it in front of me. Andrea, can you, can you project the, um, the um, motion? Thank you. Or does someone else be? I, I'll, I'll say the motion. I move that the Planning Commission approve the request of a conditional use permit to operate a large scale commercial entertainment and recreation use and the transportation demand management plan at 380 Industrial Road based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the staff report and as conditioned in the conditional use permit. I get a second. I can second that. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, may I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. Well, thank you and congratulations to Otto Reno. Let's move on to the next, hey. next item in our public hearing which is the comprehensive update to the protected tree ordinance. Would staff like to make a presentation? Yes. Good evening, Chair Aruf, Planning Commissioners, members of the public. Uh, I am Ruta Dande, Associate Planner uh, at the City of San Carlos. The next item before you tonight are proposed amendments pertaining to the zoning ordinance uh, regarding protected trees. Uh, before I begin the presentation, I would like to introduce our project team, uh, Andrea Mardesic, uh, Principal Planner, and Julia Hoffman, Contract Assistant Planner, along with our city retained arborist, Ellen Shia, uh, who is with us tonight. Next slide, please. Uh, Tonight, we are recommending uh, to adopt a resolution uh, that the City Council introduce an ordinance to fully replace San Carlos Municipal Code Section uh, 18.18.070 trees and amendments to 18.41 terms and definitions. Uh, this is pursuant to Government Code Section 65853 and 65850 and the San Carlos Municipal Chapter 18.136. Uh, this is because when a change in the zoning ordinance that is title 18 is found necessary the planning commission uh, shall hold a public hearing to consider such change and render its decision to the city council therefore we are here tonight uh, for the recommendation to the city council in today's presentation i will be going through the background and history of this topic uh, summary of the proposed amendments to the chapter trees, uh, questions by the commission and uh, by the commission, and followed by some time for public comments, discussion, and then the final action. So to, uh, so to give you a little bit of background on this topic, on May 10, 2021, the City Council held a study session on protected trees, uh, and. Uh, and recommended staff uh, to come back uh, with a more comprehensive update to the tree ordinance. Uh, and at the same meeting, uh, there was a consensus to go forward and adopt an urgency ordinance. Uh, therefore, on June 14th, an interim urgency ordinance was adopted for a period of 45 days, followed by June, 20, uh, June 12th. Uh, of 2021, uh, when this urgency ordinance was extended. Uh, for, to allow staff uh, enough time to work on the comprehensive updates of the tree ordinance. 
So on uh, September 7th of 2021, uh, staff conducted plan a study session with the Planning Commission where we received uh, very uh, helpful comments from the Planning Commission. And since then, staff has been working on uh, incorporating those com comments within the permanent ordinance. Then earlier this year in February, uh, staff conducted a study session with the planning, uh, with the joint sorry, not a study session, but an informational session with the Planning Commission and RDRC that majorly focused on an update to the ongoing work and the completed work at that time and received comments on the permanent ordinance um, work that was conducted by the staff. At tonight's meeting, the Planning Commission will be taking an action to recommend proposed amendments to the City Council for the protected tree ordinance. The intent of the ordinance amendments is to introduce a more comprehensive protected tree ordinance uh, as requested or as um, directed by the city council. And then uh, the ordinance amendments are also to ensure that uh, the significant and thriving population of large healthy trees in San Carlos is maintained. I would like to note here the proposed text amendments are indicated from page 96 through 109 within the published packet. In the next few slides, I'll be going through the proposed major changes within the protected tree ordinance that is proposed for recommendation to the city council tonight. The proposed amendments are majorly, majorly built upon the urgency ordinance 1572 that was um, adopted by the city council um, in July last year. And the proposed ordinance update differs from the adopted urgency ordinance uh, in few major categories that are uh, underlined um, text before you tonight in the uh, table on this slide. So I will go um, uh, category, uh, I will explain or summarize it uh, through the categories uh, before you. So category one is significant trees. Uh, the height at which significant trees are measured is proposed to change from 48 inches to 54 inches. Uh, this is uh, proposed to be in line with the current uh, standard practices. Uh, similarly, the measurement unit is proposed to be represented in diameter rather than circumference, which is also a standard practice. In category two, which is heritage trees, all heritage tree thresholds are proposed to correspond to diameter versus circumference, which was previously used. It is also important to note uh, that uh, if you do a direct comparison uh, with the previous uh, ordinance thresh, uh, heritage tree, tree trunk thresholds, um, the, tree, uh, the tree trunk thresholds seem to have reduced, uh, but however, the height at which they are now proposed to be measured is six inches higher than before. So uh, therefore, uh, the proposed amendments are uh, a reasonable change and uh, does not considerably change from what, what it was before. Next slide, please. In category three, that is non-protected trees. Um, uh, the non-protected trees, regardless of size, are proposed to add monocot trees, uh, including all palm relat relatives. This is a new addition to non-protected trees. Uh, under category four, the minimum replanting size is fixed uh, to 24 inches box for repla replacement trees, or it is based on a sliding scale per uh, the administrative guidelines. So the administrative guidelines is a separate supplemental document, which you can see in your packet as attachment nine. Under category five, uh, that is the replanting tree species. The heritage trees are proposed to be replaced by heritage trees uh, from the heritage tree list. And all other significant trees uh, are, rec are um, required to be replaced uh, using the preferred tree list. Now, this preferred tree list is again a supplemental document that is part of um, attachment nine uh, of the planning packet. 
the ordinance also specifies that replanting shall happen within four months of the approval unless associated with a development application. Under category six, uh, tree planting, uh, replanting fees are proposed to be introduced when replanting is not possible on site. However, the infeasibility of planting on site shall be at the discretion of the city arborist. So previously there was no provision of tree fees and this is a new addition. Apart from that, category seven includes definitions. Uh, so there were multiple definitions that were added to the ordinance, uh, including trimming, pruning, construction activity, tree protection zone, city arborist and admi administrative guidelines, uh, which a staff anticipates would clarify the ordinance. In addition to the proposed changes as uh, described uh, earlier, the proposed ordinance also includes the following text amendments. Uh, start, uh, staff has worked with the city retained arborist to strengthen the language within the proposed ordinance to provide clarity and ensure effective implementation. The amendments include updates um, to the following areas, uh, which is uh, before you on the slide, which includes language for tree removal criteria, as I mentioned, defining additional terms, uh, including application submission, uh, submittal requirements, and also clarifying language on replacement tree requirements. In addition um, to the text amendment, staff has prepared two supplemental documents for, for administrative and internal proce processing procedures. Uh, these two documents are the San Carlos Protected Tree Administrative Guidelines document, which also includes a preferred tree list, which is attachment nine of the staff packet. And the administrative guidelines include uh, many, many topics, including uh, size and replacement tree requirements, methods of measuring height of a tree trunk, measuring width of the tree trunk, tree appraisal methods that are uh, recommended to be utilized, and then um, permit application requirements based on each category or each criteria of uh, tree removal. Uh, the preferred tree list was also developed in consultation with the city retained arborist, uh, which is suitable for public and private properties. This list is proposed to be used citywide and is proposed to replace the existing list of approved street trees, which was previously commonly used by public works and the community development department. Uh, the methodology adopted by the city arborist to develop this new preferred tree list is included as an attachment seven, uh, if, you, uh, if you would like to take a look at that. It is also important to note here that these documents are not included in the ordinance for adoption by the city council, but would remain a separate document that could be later updated easily if required at the discretion of the director uh, in consultation with the city arborist. Next slide, please. The, um, I would like to highlight few staff recommendations that uh, came out from this uh, uh, project. Uh, the proposed ordinance, uh, as, you, as you must have referred to it, assigns significant responsibilities to the city arborist to make major decisions, particularly preparing and review, reviewing arborist reports, uh, formulating conditions of approval for tree removal permits, and conducting site visits, uh, among many other responsibilities. Uh, so staff at the community development department lacks the expertise to carry out these arborist specific responsibilities at this point. Therefore, staff is requesting the city council to allocate funds for up to full-time contract arborist to assist in processing applications and implementing the provisions of the proposed ordinance. Any work related to specific properties or development would be paid by the applicant or homeowner, but the city council decision is pending uh, budget approval at the March 28, 2022 meeting. 
Staff believes that utilizing a city arborist for identified tasks, which I will go over in the next slide, will uh, help in reducing staff's time spent on tree removal applications. As a result, it is anticipated that could lower cost to applicants. For example, the current fees for all tree removal applications includes uh, arborist deposit, technology fee and processing fee, and staff anticipates that with uh, in increased budget for um, up to full-time contract arborists, the back and forth would be reduced and a uh, few of these responsibilities could be carried out by the arborist. The changes to the ordinance would allow for the arborist to make the decision on tree removal permits, tree protection plans, and development application regarding impact fees. Additionally, um, staff also received few public comments suggesting to reduce uh, the dead tree removal application fees. So staff worked on that. The comment highlighted how the city's dead tree removal fees are higher than other neighboring jurisdictions. So staff is currently working to check feasibility of incorporating the proposed dead tree application fee changes as part of the comprehensive fee schedule. This fee could potentially be considered considerably reduced if the city council were to approve the budget for the city arborist up to um, full-time contract arborist. If approved, staff have identified a few long-term projects uh, that the city arborist may also work on. And if so, directed by the city council, these include um, inventory citywide protected trees, research feasibility of citywide invasive species removal program, research feasibility to assist citizens for dead tree removals, and research feasibility of providing financial assistance for tree removal, if so directed by the city council. Next slide, please. Yeah. The city of San Carlos uh, zoning ordinance is required to be consistent with the city's general plan. And in order to recommend uh, these proposed amendments, um, there are certain findings that needs to be made. Uh, the orange text is the finding that uh, will be that will be making tonight. The proposed ordinance amendments are consistent with the general plan since um, uh, it meets the goal. Um, uh, as, as I mentioned in the general plan, which is to enhance the urban forest and the actions um, that are consistent, are consistent with the proposed amendments is to maintain and expand the urban canopy uh, along with action uh, number two, that is review and amend the zoning ordinance accordingly. So staff believes that this um, finding can be made with the proposed amendments. And the second finding is the ordinance amendment is consistent with the purpose of the zoning title to promote the growth of the city in an orderly manner and to promote and protect the public health, safety, peace, comfort, and general welfare. Again, staff believes that this finding can be made um, as discussed in the staff report uh, for the proposed amendments. This meeting was advertised using various so social media mediums, including um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, an email blast was sent out to uh, re uh, requested uh, applicants. Then a uh, uh, citywide postcard was also sent, which you can see on the slide before you. Uh, staff received few public comments suggesting to reduce the dead tree removal applications fee, which we have, uh, which I already discussed in the previous slide. Um, one com com comment that we um, received uh, this morning or actually over the weekend was about redwood trees. And um, uh, this comment was uh, that and was forwarded to the planning commission. But I, I would like to highlight that because staff is making a recommendation, a new staff recommendation based on that comment. 
which uh, was uh, which highlighted that redwood trees um, should not be considered as indigenous trees and should be uh, on a do not plant category in our preferred tree list so staff is um, staff consulted the city retained arborist who also agrees with the same and therefore staff is recommending to categorize redwood tree as do not plant tree and within the ordinance text itself staff is recommending to specify that a heritage tree removal shall be replaced with a heritage tree with an exception to redwood trees these are the two um, new uh, recommendations in relation to the public comment that was made uh, is what staff is recommending Here is the timeline for the protected tree ordinance uh, project. Today, March 21st, uh, would, um, is the PC recommendation to the city council. April 11th, we anticipate to go back to the city council uh, with the first reading, followed by April 25th uh, is the second reading. After 30 days of the second reading, the new ordinance would be effective at which time the urgency ordinance uh, will become ineffect ineffective and would expire. Again, at today's meeting, staff is rec recommending to adopt a resolution recommending that the City Council introduce an ordinance uh, to fully replace the code section um, mentioned on the slide before you. This concludes my staff presentation. Again, I'm Rucha Dende. Happy to answer any clarifying questions. Uh, we also have with us Andrea Mardisic, Julia Hoffman, and Ellen, who is a city, city retained arborist who can answer any technical questions related to trees. And uh, I'm here to answer any clarifying questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ruka. And um, let's so. I just want to compliment you on your presentation, Ms. <laughs> Thank you so much. Are there clarifying questions before we open for public comment? Um, I see Vice Chair, um, Vice Chair Clements. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask staff to clarify why the removal of the monocots. I don't think the staff memo explained that. I would like to defer that question to Ellen. Ellen, uh, will you be able to answer that question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, previously, the ordinance referred only to palms, and there are some palm relatives that behave like palms but are not botanically palms. So um, I recommended that we use the word monocot to include those palm relatives that would be things like yucca or cordyline, um, Joshua tree, which doesn't grow here, but that's a, a, a similar palm relative. Or bamboo, I see. Um, could you also just note why those are would not be protected trees? Because be, you know palm trees are uh, very picturesque, and I and do think a lot of people like them, although they're not that easy to take care of. Palm trees were listed as not protected trees in the previous ordinance, I believe. So um, I think maybe part of the reason that they would not be protected is they don't provide significant environmental benefits uh, compared to woody trees. A woody tree has a large canopy and those leaves can um, absorb pollutants. They can provide shade and cool the uh, surrounding area. They can capture storm water and direct it downwards. And palm trees really, in the big picture, don't provide those sorts of environmental benefits. I did not know that. Thank you. Commissioner Garvey. Um, thank you, Chair Roof. Um, one, one question. Um, Rusha, in your presentation, you mentioned that if you're, if you're not able to replant a tree, there's a replanting fee that you pay in 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 place of that. Um, I'm curious, where does the money for that go? Does it go into the general fund for the city, or is does it go into some sort of a a dedicated tree fund that might be used to plant trees in another part of the city? Can you help clarify that? 
That is correct. It goes to the tree fund, which would be uh, which um, would be utilized to um, plant trees, replant trees. That is correct. Excellent. Thank you. That's my only question. And, and through the chair, if I could just add to that, um, the fee that would be established for that is not um, has not been adopted by council yet. So that would be one of the future steps um, okay. should it be adopted. Thank you for that clarification. I, I have a, a, a question. I'm, I'm sort of trying to look at this from the perspective of a of a homeowner who might have a tree that they're considering uh, removed, uh, which would be which would be a protected tree. Um, and there's a, we've seen a few examples of this come before the planning commission before. So I'm curious to see how the uh, ordinance would, um, would would govern these situations. And one of them is uh, is safety. So if there's a, a potential for falling uh, falling branches or the tree is old, um, the, a, another scenario that I'd like to understand um, what the recourse for the homeowner would be is if it's um, um, causing structural damage, say it's growing right next to the house and causing cracking of the foundation or has that. Um, um, and, and the third one is uh, if, if, an, if you want to build an ADU, and there's a tree in the way, uh, and this may be more broadly. Uh, what so what can uh, what would be allowed, um, and what would um, how would uh, that proceed for those three different options: the um, safety, structural damage, and ADU. So for uh, safety and structural damage, we do have a, dis a decision making criteria, which is uh, tree risk rating and uh, development under the tree risk rating. Uh, we do have um, a provision where it says that the city arborist may consider danger to people and property in assessing the risk to making a decision. So we do have that provision. So it would be at the discretion of the city arborist when they review the plans, uh, whether that uh, tree poses a risk to the, um, you know, danger to people and uh, property. So we do have a provision for that. Uh, the other um, question was about ADUs uh, and trees. Is that right? Yes, that was one of them. So, uh, Andrea, do you want to um, help answer that question? <laughs> sure, of course. Uh, so with ADUs, um, you know, as, as you're all aware, the state has um, some minimum requirements, which we have to approve, and that is um, an 800 square foot ADU, no more than 16 feet tall. So as part of the review of an ADU, if someone were to come in and say, I'd like to build this ADU, but I need to remove a tree to do so, um, we're not required right off the bat to automatically approve removal of that tree. It would take some back and forth and looking at the plans and really determining a few things. One, you know, what's the health of the tree? Is it a high value tree? Is there anywhere else to do the ADU that, that makes sense and that isn't, um, you know, a big burden to the homeowner financially um, as compared to the, the place they're looking at. So um, we would first try to determine, you know, how, how healthy is this tree? Can we try to save it? And is there a reasonable opportunity to do so? Now, if there's not, then we do ultimately, because we have to allow an ADU of that size and, and height to be built, we would ultimately have to allow removal of that tree if there's no other option. Um, but it couldn't be just because a homeowner wanted to get rid of an ADU, but, or I'm sorry, get rid of a tree because their ADU needs to be on the left side of the property or, or whatever the case may be. That helps. Thank you. Any additional clarifying questions before we open for public comment? Okay, let's go to the public comment slide. If you would like to make a public comment on agenda item 6B, proposed amendments to the protected tree ordinance, now is the time to speak. And you can join via Zoom or you can um, join on the phone, pressing star nine and then star six to unmute when called upon. Um, Dara, is there anyone in the waiting room for public comment on this topic? Yes, we have Tom. Tom, I have allowed you to speak and you have two minutes. Okay, there we go. I'm unmuted. Yes. Hi, this is Tom Felity. Uh, good evening, commissioners. 
I've been following this ordinance uh, since uh, September, and uh, I like most of what I see, but there's a couple of areas where I still think I'd like to see more. Um, and uh, that is, uh, first of all, in the area of fees. Um, the um, I know it was uh, in the com in the uh, presentation. Uh, it was said that uh, if an arborist could be approved by the council, then uh, there may be a chance of substantially reducing the fees for dead tree removal. My question is: is if uh, since that's uh, not going to be decided until March 28th, is it premature to at this time recommend that this? Uh, proposed ordinance be uh, uh, adopted uh, by the council in full, as it's stated. Um, so that's one issue. The second one is, uh, I, although there's areas there for notification, it's notification of a removal of a tree. I wanted to see more language there about notification to homeowners of the existence of the ordinance and also to uh, tree service companies that operate in the area. Um, back in September, I suggested a permit process for tree service companies so that we could have some control over um, what they do and what they don't do, uh, because oftentimes the homeowners refer to the tree service company for advice on what can be removed and what uh, with, a, with or without a permit. Um, and finally, the third thing is, as I noticed, there was a mention made uh, based upon a comment um, uh, within the last day about redwood trees being a no plant tree and that that should be added to this uh, ordinance that you're about to vote on. Um, I don't know why a redwood tree is a um, tree that is bad to plant uh, and it should be removed from its um, heritage tree status. So perhaps um, the arborist can uh, answer that question. But most important to me is the uh, idea of timing of approval, which is to say that uh, the arborist will not be approved uh, before you all recommend this uh, uh, ordinance to be uh, forwarded to the council for their approval. Thank you. And thank you. And, and um, let's um, let let's if the arborist could briefly respond. I, I don't want to lose that that. <laughs> clarifying question about the uh, redwood tree um, expound a little bit more on why it should not be considered a heritage um, just um, before Is Ellen uh, oh sorry yeah. <laughs> yes Andrea go ahead so before um, Arbor's response I did want to clarify um, redwood trees will still be considered protected um, so existing redwood trees would be protected um, what we're proposing to change is um, allowing a redwood tree to be a replacement tree for another heritage tree um, or even for its, its own self just because um, most of the, the lots around here um, are, are pretty small and as we know redwood trees grow very fast. Um, I believe though there, and Richard please correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there is the, the possibility for a city arborist to approve a redwood tree as a replacement in certain instances if the homeowner really wanted one. Um, since the arborist has has the ability to to make other recommendations, um, so that I just wanted to clarify that point with redwood trees. Um, any existing trees would would still be protected, of course. Um, in terms of the uh, the fees, so the uh, council is looking at their budget on March twenty eighth, um, and if recommended, this ordinance would be going to them on April 11th, 11th. I Thank you. Yes. Um, so the budget would, you know, hopefully be adopted with this, this change before they get the first reading um, of the ordinance. And then um, to the third item with the tree service companies, uh, we definitely agree that there needs to be education and outreach uh, for tree service companies. And uh, we're looking at how we can, um, you know, list the ones that are aware of the San Carlos policies or, you know, committed to them so we can have that available for homeowners, um, things like that. So I think that answers the three questions, but I'm-, I'm Thank you. That, that's good. And um, um, Ellen, if you will still give you a chance to comment on the, uh, why redwood trees aren't good for San Carlos in new plantings. Uh, well, they're high water use trees. If you looked at my um, memo, you'll see that my one of my primary criteria for putting a tree on the preferred tree list was that it had a low water use rating according to um, the water use classification of landscape species known as WUCLs. Um, it's all in there about where that website is and how they operate. Um, but uh, Redwoods, I see drought stress redwoods throughout the Bay Area. 
And in addition, they're often very large. So even where they are still healthy and getting enough water, they often um, have to be either removed or chopped down to, you know, very unesthetic ways uh, because they are out of scale for small urban lots. So um, on my list, I didn't go so far as say, saying do not plant, but I basically put them as not recommended for pretty much anything that they should not be preferred. Um, you don't have to go as far as banning them, but I certainly would think there's a very narrow band of circumstances under which I would recommend one. Thank you for clarifying. Let's continue with uh, public comments. Uh, Dara, is there anyone else in the waiting room for public comment? Yes, we have Zenovi. Zenovi, I have allowed you to talk and you have two minutes. Zenobi, you seem to have gone on mute. Uh, we don't hear you, Zenobi. Hello? Oh, now we hear you. Welcome. Okay. It didn't work the first time, sorry. Okay, um, so I am concerned about the paragraph E of the decision-making criteria uh, section of the protected tree removal permit and decision-making criteria chapter. Okay, so because the current wording uh, leaves a lot of room for misinterpretation, misuse, and abuse. Uh, particularly troublesome is a phrase uh, uh, while achieving the applicant's reasonable development objectives or reasonable economic enjoyment of the property as a, uh, as a um, pretext or an excuse to remove the tree. And uh, the problem is, uh, uh, and how is reasonable uh, defined? That opens the door for abuse. I have a simple recommendation that uh, um, the ordinance is straightforward was, you know, says no healthy heritage tree removal is permitted under any circumstances unless the existing trees started to endanger human life or an existing human dwelling. Developers have to assess the sites targeted for future development with regards to existing healthy heritage trees and plan accordingly. They cannot count that, you know, city is going to uh, roll over and approve the, uh, uh, any tree removal. In case a heritage tree is removed or damaged by design or accident, accident during construction, then penalty shall be planting a new tree, a fine of $5,000 plus construction permit withdrawal for a period of 10 years. So that everybody would know ahead of time that they, they, they cannot plan on buying a piece of land like the uh, uh, Black Mountain development and try to remove 159 heritage trees just because, okay? This is not right. Okay, thank you for your comments. Dara, is there anyone else in the waiting room for public comment? Yes, we have Sheetal. Sheetal, I have allowed you to talk and you have two minutes. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, so I wanted to expand on one of the, the questions that David posed earlier in terms of the structural damage piece. Um, so if there is a heritage tree causing structural damage to the home um, and you have to replant a heritage tree, is the expectation that it has to go in the exact same site or could it be moved to a different part of the property? So that's my first question. And I don't know if you want me to stop in between to, to allow for answers or no, if I can- Better just ask all your questions okay. in, the minute, in the two minute window. <laughs> Great. And then the second question is, um, how do the fees apply if the tree is located at both on the public property side and on the private property side? Um, so it's sort of in half. <laughs> Those are my two questions. Okay, thank you. Um, do, Andrea, do you want to very briefly respond to those? I can, or, I can um, answer those. Oh, thank you, Richard. Or, or Ruka, <laughs> whoever's appropriate. Yeah, so um, for the first question, no, it doesn't have to be uh, replanted at the exact same location. It can be any, anywhere per the arborist um, on site. 
And the second question was, uh, if the tree is located half on the public property and half on the private property, how do the fees apply? So any tree that is located in front of um, a property, the property owner is responsible for it, its maintenance and also removal. So uh, as far as I know, uh, the application fee would be um, would need to be paid in full uh, by the property owner uh, adjacent or in front of that tree. Thank you. And yeah. I, I would also like to, through the chair, I would like to uh, um, clarify uh, the public comment Previously, like before this public comment, I would like to uh, clarify that the uh, section E that uh, the person was um, referring to was incorrect. I, I don't know, there are, there are too many attachments to this packet, so I think uh, what he was referring to was the incorrect section. What he should refer to uh, uh, is on packet page 102. Uh, which is the correct uh, proposed um, language, which does not have any language such as reasonable, um, financial, um, or whatever was um, highlighted during uh, this uh, the comment. Uh, thank you for that clarification. That's important. It was confusing. There's multiple versions of the uh, old and new. So you got to look at the, the new one starting on. Uh, right. on I, I apologize on page, for that. Um, 96. I got confused. So I know uh, pages 96 to 109 is the proposed um, ordinance. So look there. You'll be happy, much happier with that wording. Uh, let's let's move on for additional uh, sort of making exceptions to the normal. Uh, normally, we just receive public comment, but uh, some of these are sort of obvious clarifying points that's in our benefit to look at. But usually, we just receive the comments. Let's move on to the next public comment, if there is one. Sarah? Yes, uh, Liz, I've allowed you to talk, and you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Liz Reniker, and I'm sitting here with my wonderful neighbor, Anastasia. She asked for my help in obtaining a tree removal permit, and I was happy to help her investigate the situation and complete the application process. Unfortunately, we ran into a few problems along the way. Anastasia has a very large sweet gum tree, also known as liquid ambar, that was originally planted by the city of San Carlos many decades ago in the strip between the sidewalk and the street. Um, because of its size, it's now considered a protected tree with a very large trunk circumference. But the problem is this tree is a safety issue for Anastasia, as well as the general public. It's pretty hazardous because for several months of the year, this tree drops round, hard seed pods that have caused several people to slip on the sidewalk or sprain ankles. Because of this, Anastasia is afraid to walk outside of her home for most of the year. Um, Additionally, the cost of maintaining this tree is high. Not only does she pay for a gardener to help collect these seed pods on a regular basis um, from her side, sidewalk in the driveway, um, she's also considering looking into costs for having an arborist treat the tree to prevent the seed pods from forming, and that would be an extensive annual cost on top of hiring a company to prune it. Additionally, the roots continue to lift up the sidewalk and cause a tripping hazard, and she's also spent several thousands of dollars repairing the sidewalk many times. So our concerns when we were looking into this process were first that the cost of the permit application is extremely high. Um, you know, we just went through this process in recent months and, and saw that it was about $713. And this is uh, especially difficult for a senior citizen like Anastasia who's on a fixed income. So that's a big barrier for her to try to understand what her options are. And the second issue is that uh, we wanna make sure homeowners have reasonable rights to determine what trees are on their properties. Uh, the city of San Carlos didn't consult Anastasia when planting this tree, and now she feels stuck. She's not sure if she'll get a, an approval to remove it. Anastasia is sitting with me here, so I would love for her to have her own two minutes to speak, if that would be allowed. Okay, since they're separate people. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Anastasia. I have lived in the city of Good Living for 42 years. I raised my kids and grandkids in San Carlos. I love San Carlos. But like uh, David said, it's a safety issue for me. I'm 84 years old. My balance is no good. I'm going through therapy. Every time I go out, the, the gumballs are next to my car. It's all over the sidewalk, my driveway, up to my steps. I'm almost like a prisoner in my house at night. I can't, when time comes to take the garbage out, I'm scared to death. So 
I'm, I know that removing the tree is a protected tree, but at the same token, people should be protected. And for me, it's a safety issue and a protection. If I fall and I break my hip or another bone, another bone at 84, either I'll end up in a wheelchair or dead. So my safety is my concern and the safety of the public. I live on Britain. Um, people walk their dogs. As you know, they go to school to Britain Acres. The kids walk there. People run. Um, there is a lot of uh, traffic, human traffic. And a lot of people have slipped and fell. So um, I, I'm requesting um, that I be able to take away that tree that it's a hazard for me and the public. It's not only me, but it's the public too. So I'll appreciate any consideration about that. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for your comments and we'll, we'll register those and, um, and consider them going forward. Um, of course, we, we don't respond to a specific, that specific instance uh, that, that would be up for the staff. Um, Dara, are there additional callers? There are none at this time. Okay, I'm waiting a few seconds. We'll see if anybody else jumps in before we close the public comment. Okay, uh, there doesn't seem to be anyone else waiting for public comment, so I would entertain a motion to close the public comment. I'll move that we close the public comment period. Commissioner Bradley, was that a second? Yes, I seconded. Thank you. We have a, a motion and a second. Can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Harvey? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. Okay, discussion for the planning commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, would anybody like to make comments? Commissioner Garvey. Thank you, Chair Roof. I'll, I'll jump in and start. Um, I think this ordinance goes a long way towards ensuring um, a significant and thriving population of trees in San Carlos. I appreciate all of the thoughtful work that went into this ordinance. Um, one of the things that bubbled to the top for me is we heard um, not only tonight, but in previous uh, study sessions from the public, just how uh, high our tree removal fees are. And it seems to me, and I support the idea of bringing on a, 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 a full-time or a part-time arborist uh, to help with this tree program. But I think ultimately this arborist, having him or her on site will trickle down to the homeowner and result in less money out of pocket that the homeowner has to spend because the arborist is gonna be more efficient in writing the reports. And we used to bill for tree removal on a cost recovery basis. So I think this arborist can uh, help us in a number of ways. And one of them is to respond to what we've heard from so many callers, let's get our tree removal fees down. So I, I support the changes that staff has brought before us this evening, and in particular, the um, bringing on of, of an arborist. Thank you. Thank you. I support what Commissioner Garvey has said, and uh, just wanna also add, the city of good living thrives on neighbors helping neighbors, as I forget her name, but who represented uh, Alexandria, I think, and, that's one of the reasons I'm on the planning commission is to help people individually and to help the city as a whole, of course, and there's some transportation and housing issues, but I, it warms my heart to hear a neighbor come in and speak for someone else. And by the way, I'm older than you, Alexandria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Bradley. Well put. Uh, Commissioner, Vice Chair Clements. Thank you. I also enjoyed hearing um, neighbors helping with processes for the city, which aren't always easy to figure out, right? Everyone knows that. 
no offense to cities, it's just processes, you know, people have to figure them out. Um, in reading the long uh, packet, looking through it, um, I did see our minutes from the earlier meeting in which we considered um, the tree ordinance and, or I guess the urgency ordinance or received the study session, I should say. And then, I, you know, looking through the minutes and our comments, I felt like staff really had responded to a lot of the things that we had brought up. And the staff arborist uh, was right from the minutes that we had encouraged the staff arborist to be pursued and it is being pursued and, and hopefully budgeted in short order. And so I think that that is a really important part of this program. Um, and I do hope that the, um, the use of the arborist and potential fee reductions is an also another important part of the program to make this really work for the residents um, as we also try to make it work for our environment and for our greenery. Um, I also noted that the comments were that we um, hope that there's wide distribution of information that this ordinance is going to be considered again um, when it comes back. And uh, I was very happy to see the postcard in the mail um, because I think a lot of people are interested in this topic here. So thank you to staff for making that happen and for all of your work on this. It's a considerable amount of work, mm -hmm. but I think it's worth it because I think it's, it's helping the environment and it's helping the beauty of, um, of our lovely community. Um, and, you know, again, I appreciate the sensitivity of the trees that today we need to think about replacing. Um, and while I do like redwood trees, I appreciate um, the arborist or the consultant's comment that we do have to think about being water wise and uh, in proportionate scale to what our community um, the size of our community and our lots. So I feel like a lot of thought has been put into the work. So Kristen may have froze. Um, thanks. Let's see, I had an internet glitch there. Are you hearing me now? No, yes, I think it was mine. Okay, good. Okay, good. Thank you. No, thank you for those comments. Um, yeah, I also um, I th think the ordinance has um, been shaped uh, according to um, the feedback from the Planning Commission and from the public, and really appreciate that. And um, I think it's headed in the right the right direction. The um, as far as the fee issue goes. Um, the the ordinance as written builds in the arbor the city arborist um, role and, and decision making capability and so if the um, ordinance is passed then, then that that efficiency would happen but there still would be I think a um, a cost recovery basis for setting the fees which potentially could be fairly expensive so I'm somewhat still somewhat concerned that um, that um, it's going to cost seven hundred dollars to uh, to deal with your tree is uh, is going to be the way forward uh, with the possible exception uh, made for for dead trees but um, so that is a concern I'm not sure what to do about that I mean you could you could say perhaps a cap or a cap on the fees or some sort of a more standardized schedule so people um, understand, including <laughs> including us and the city council, what uh, what we're talking here, um, as opposed to um, just dividing the cost of the of the arborist across the, uh, the the number of permits that are received, uh, applications that are received. So I'm a little, I'm still a little concerned that the fees that we haven't controlled the fees adequately, um, uh, but the um, I, I note that the the fee issue is not what we're um, 
not what we're endorsing for to recommend to the city council at this moment, but we could if we wanted uh, attached to our endorsement of the, the thing that we would like ask them to seriously consider as a separate it's a separate topic to seriously consider um, keeping a cap on those fees um, because um, I think it can be counterproductive to our mission of uh, promoting uh, healthy tree management if the if the fees are in the um, seven hundred dollar plus um, range for, for even the basic um, operations. That's my first comment. And um, I guess in the spirit of taking turns, uh, I have another comment on a different a different part of this, but um, I'll, I can hand it off to, um, to Vice Chair Clements and then I'll take my turn after her. Oh, thank you, Chair. I, I just had an idea from what you were saying was that um, I'm wondering if we could suggest that the fee schedule um, also include a hardship waiver uh, element to the program so that if fees were exorbitant, but somebody were on a fixed income, for instance, that they could potentially apply for a hardship waiver for the fees as an example. Um, and I, yeah. I also appreciate that fees generally are cost recovery for staff. That's kind of the definition of fees in general um, that reimburse for staff time. So, but I, I do think it might be warranted at least under a financial, financially stressed situation that um, someone might not have to pay for that service. Um, so just wanted to raise that potential. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I like that idea myself. Um, maybe that's something we could um, we can ask the city council to to consider the staff and the city council to consider uh, because um, it, if you're building a, a new a new development, cost of dealing with a permit fee is just part of the business, and, and your eyes are wide open to that. I'm less worried about that, but. Um, a lot of the older houses that might have um, people uh, on more limited income uh, have big trees. And so um, that is something that is an angle. I like that a lot. I like it too. Okay. Good idea. Maybe we can consider um, making that a, 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 a police consider um, addition to our, our recommendation to the city council. The, um, the next the next thought I, I wanted I wanted to clarify if somebody is building a new house or, uh, or building and a heritage tree is in the way, um, how would that be this kind of a question back in the question category for staff? How would that be handled? I mean, can they can you just pay the price per tree and cut it down, or can that be can that just stop you from building or something else? Explain what would happen in that scenario. I want to build a structure a building that otherwise would be allowed. Um, there's a heritage tree in the in the way. Yeah, so that kind of uh, protected tree removal would fall under uh, the section criteria E, development. And in that situation, the applicant would have to submit a um, few design alternatives that prove that um, a reasonable design is not possible uh, that would uh, help save the tree and that would be reviewed by staff and the city arborist and then um, the um, decision would be rendered based on that i see so the if it's snack in the middle and there's just no way to to put up to, to utilize the property then then removal of the tree might be allowed, but if, if, if reasonable adjustments could be made, then... But yeah, if, if, they were, if they can submit at least two design options that mm -hmm. prove that um, there is no other reasonable design um, that would help build a new house and save the tree, then um, uh, the decision could be um, considered to remove the tree but that would again uh, be at the discretion of the city arborist and by uh, review from the planning division and so is the presumption that the property owner is entitled to build um, 
to build to the their maximum envelope if um so in, in other words the answer couldn't be no you can't build a 200 square foot house you only can build the 100 uh, 1000 square foot house because there's a tree i mean it, but or is the assumption that yeah, you need to be able to build your 2000 square feet that would otherwise be allowed see what i mean if I could jump in and, and answer mm -hmm. that, um, sure. just to just to step back um, a little bit, and I think this is what one of the earlier um, public comments was referring to. Our yes. previous code had a pretty general exception or regulation that would allow uh, a property owner to remove a tree, you know, based on general enjoyment and economic um, economic enjoyment of the property, and that was you know ones that we were seeing come in all the time. Um, and I think, to be fair, was probably one of the, the ones that was the biggest concern to staff and, and probably the community. Um, so we took that away as part of as part of development. And under this new regulation, I would say that it's not just a numeric standard of, for example, if I, you know, if you make me keep this tree, I'm going to lose 200 square feet. I don't think that would be an argument to get rid of the tree. Um, what we've seen is, um, you know, we've had one come in, for example, where we also looked at the uh, value of the tree. So they were two, the one I'm thinking of was two Italian cypresses that were in good health anyways. Um, but they were on the way they were situated is part of the house would have to be very narrow to like fit between them and keep and keep both of them. And so there's definitely design uh, measures that can be taken, whether it's you know, building an L-shaped house or um, maybe removing one tree and not two. Um, so it's not just going to be an American standard. I think that's something we definitely want to stay away from in terms of deciding what's reasonable or not. Um, and I think it's important to point out that if there is a high value um, protected tree on site, that the, you know, the option that the homeowner wants the most for their new home might not be the one that ends up being approved because there's another option that allows you know them to keep the tree. Maybe it's not their first choice of how everything's designed, um, but th that's something we really want to take into account. Um, and even along those those same lines, we've we've narrowed it even further to talk about damage to habitable space. Um, so not you know removing a, a healthy tree that's protected because your walkway, you know, in your backyard is going to be going there and you want the tree gone. So we've narrowed it in a few ways. Um, and, and sorry, that was kind of a drawn out response, but I would say it, it needs to be, the, it, the burden of proof is on the applicant to demonstrate why the tree needs to go basically. Okay, that that helps. These are, these are not easy. And so it's good to understand um, the thinking. And it seems like the new ordinance does grapple and define these issues pretty well. Uh, much better than in the past, where um, where it was kind of a, a, a judgment call without a lot of guidelines uh, for the staff to make. So, um, yeah. so, so I think I'm, I think this ordinance addresses, in my opinion, this, the proposed ordinance addresses that concern pretty well. I wanted to make sure we got got it out there exactly how how it would work in those scenarios. This is of interest to a lot of people, including us as commissioners. Any other thoughts before we um, compose our um, our recommendation? Can we have the um, the slide with the recommendation on it? The resolution, I guess, it's the resolution. Or is it a recommendation? Um, oh, so we um, we spoke. Um, Commissioner Clements had, had, I thought, a very wise suggestion of encouraging the city council to consider, so we can say we adopt this resolution and encourage the city council to, uh, to look into how we can have a, um, there's maybe a couple elements there, a, um, a, a subsidized uh, fee structure, an explicit fee structure, uh, a capped fee structure. Those are kind of the three the three points that I uh, that I see that came out uh, from all of us. Um, do we have support to um, to kind of add that additional language? 
Commissioner, Vice Chair Clements. I could make the motion and then we could see. Sure. <laughs> okay. We're, propose, you're, you're very good at reciting this. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I recommend that we adopt a resolution recommending that the City Council introduce an ordinance to fully replace San Carlos Municipal Code Section 18.18.070, trees, and amendments to 18.41, terms and definitions, and also recommend that the City Council consider a fee, that the fee schedule associated with these sections um, include a financial hardship waiver for financially stressed residents uh, regarding, should we limit it to tree removals? I, I don't know what, I mean, uh, or should we not? Pruning, pruning can also be a- Okay, um, okay. so just, um, uh, and recommend that the, Okay, I could try that again. Um, and I recommend that the City Council consider an, um, a related fee resolution, um, including a financial hardship waiver for uh, residents um, related to work under the sections of the Municipal Code. And Mr. Chair, may I, may I ask a clarifying uh, question for staff? Um, Please whether your motion would also include the change that was mentioned earlier this evening about redwood trees um, and not having them on the preferred list for replanting. Oh, that's not in the, um, in the proposed. Oh, that was a, new. okay. I thought that was. Oh. I was wondering how that was being okay. handled because it wouldn't, it wasn't included in the packet. So we kind of want to capture and carry that concept along. It would, it would be useful yes. to um, include um, that. So we need another I, and. I could I could do a moreover. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a moreover. Um, Let's have a moreover. Okay, moreover. <laughs> um, I recommend that um, we accept staff's recommendation to limit the use of redwood trees to replace heritage trees, um, given the. Um, findings in the staff and uh, in the staff report and supplements. I'll second that. And could we have a a, um, a reading of that, uh, of how that was captured, just to make sure so that um, the big we're mess. all on the same page? <laughs> yes, and we'll, we'll definitely wordsmith this a little bit. But um, that's okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so adopting the resolution of proposed um, along, and, and I'll just combine uh, with the recommended changes for um, redwood trees um, to not be on the preferred replacement list. And also conveying, um, I would say unanimous, um, but I'll double check, um, unanimous um, support for consideration of a resolution to the fee schedule to allow for a fee waiver for uh, financial hardship, fixed incomes. I think seniors were also mentioned on a previous meeting, so it could be a, a few different um, um, things, but to have council consider that as part of the fee um, update as well. I support that, but I would add there be a, a cap. Also. Oh, and a cap. So that is a, an additional thought idea. And I. That was your, I, that was it your was. idea. I stole it, it was. I stole it from <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and so it sort of goes They're one step additional from what Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Clements was suggesting. Um, and in the spirit of um, keeping keeping those making people comfortable with the uh, that the fees have a um, are finite, um, I, I support that. Um, so let's get some words out there, and then we can see uh, what the other commissioners think. That uh, if I may suggest that um, I have to have an and in there and um, have a capped fee structure for defined standard um, permits, something along that line. 
Um, if I might, um, procedural, I don't want to do the hardcore procedural stuff. Technically, that'd be a, a friendly amendment to the basic motion, which is a long one, mm -hmm. um, that I would prefer if we consider separately. Okay. Can we do that? Sure. Okay. That way we can have better discussion. We can, we can. Yeah, yeah. just about yeah. capping of fees. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. let's put that aside and, um, uh, I will re-second the motion because there was the addition with the with the one other item. So I will second the motion that is on the table. With Thank the you. redwood trees and the financial yes. hardship. Yes, okay. as Thank as you. Andrea read it out to us, and uh, I think I heard Commissioner. Yep, I think we've got a motion and a second. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a discussion? Is there a discussion? We adding the cap fees. The cap we'll discuss no, next. Not to this motion. We'll discuss that next. Procedurally, oh. um, we had a motion, so um, and this was a new thing. So we'll we'll talk about that next. So we can add that as an additional recommendation to the city council if we get agreement. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any uh, discussion before we put that um, motion to vote? Um, I would say the financial hardship may not want to be, we may not want to be specific for seniors or those on fixed incomes. I mean, for someone who may be having a temporary, um, you know, about with uh, unemployment, but maybe young, um, may qualify for something like this. So I think just a definition of financial hardship and then um, leave it to staff to define how one would show that. Um, and not be more limiting than that, um, I think would be uh, fine with me. That's what I would err on the side of. I also don't want to assume that every um, senior is low income. They are not necessarily, nor are they low on assets necessarily. So, you know, I think it's really about ability to afford something. So I, I think that's a good staff and attorney question. Yeah. How would you evidence that? And, and that was, and your motion, as you stated it, did not have those um, bits. Um, so I think we can just edit that those out um, okay. for what we're considering on the table now. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. So the motion um, and the second still stand. Is there any additional discussion before we put it to vote? Okay, can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. Good. That, that was the, the heavy lifting. And now we're <laughs> left with the... <laughs> <laughs> and now we're left with the, um, the additional um, concept of suggesting that the city council consider a capped. Um, I mean, the two concepts I had uh, were, were a capped one, or at least a a, a, a standardized fee list, as opposed to um, well, it depends how many hours the arborist um, spends on your case kind of fee thing. So um, to make people comfortable with dealing with the city, uh, to um, to bring their free problem forward. Um, so it, does that a motion would, would you like to make? So, um, yeah, yeah, maybe that's the best way to, uh, to, to get it in front of us and then we can see what you guys think. So I, I, um, I move that, um, that we recommend to the city council, a, um, a capped fee structure and a, um, and where appropriate and, ex um, standardized fee structure for, um, for activities under the ordinance. I'll second that. Any discussion? Good. That? Let's discuss. Okay. Um, so um, maybe staff could clarify. Uh, one of my thoughts is that not all fees are paid or are um, charged to the homeowner, right? Some fees would be charged to developers. Um, for tree replacements, for tree and loo fees, um, as examples, 
So could you um, kind of review what the fees would be associated with the ordinance? And uh -huh. is, is this off topic? Is this uh, still in the topic enough that we can keep talking? I think um, so. I, yeah, I think we can, you know, the commission can definitely um, ask council to consider it. Um, but okay. as you, you know, said, it's kind of pulled out separate from the ordinance itself. Um, a few things too about fees and, and this, um, you know, you'll bear with me. I just want to also explain for, for the benefit of the public attending on how we currently review it and why the fees are so high and, and why staff believes those will decrease significantly. Um, right now we take in, um, and, and we do take it in um, for any application, whether it's a developer or homeowner. Um, so it's the, it's the same fees in terms of the permit. Um, when we take in an application, we take in processing time for staff, as well as a deposit to cover um, our burst time as well as um, some other uh, fees that are like technology fees and, and, and pretty minor. Um, so the, ta the staff processing time is really um, something that we think just off the bat would be knocked down because we're not going to be, staff is not going to be involved with it to the same degree. Um, that fee, as well as most of the other fees in the city, um, are adopted by council after a fee study and analysis of how much time it takes, um, you know, for instance, um, are there different departments working on it? How much time it takes for them? Is there a public notice involved? Just all these different factors. Um, so that's one thing we think will, will um, go away or, or be reduced significantly. Um, the other one, and, and I would argue is probably going to be more significant, is right now when we send an arborist out to look at a, at a site, because the ordinance requires staff to decide whether the tree is supposed to be removed, not the arborist, we as staff require pretty comprehensive arborist reports to be able to make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's that's because I think, you know, mainly we don't want to approve a tree if it's not, you know, if it, it shouldn't be. Um, and we just don't have the expertise or knowledge to do that. Um, and so having an arborist go out, and we've seen this in other cities, um, and, and in fact, most of the cities that have arborists, their fees are substantially less. But what we're envisioning is an arborist could go to the site um, and you know make their determination there. Maybe you know they still have to do the paperwork, but it doesn't need to be a ten-page arborist report. It doesn't need to be every tree on the property marked out, an analysis taken, and you know it's something that inherently, for the most part, I think they would be able to do relatively quickly. Um, the second part to that is even once we get the report, I would say at least half the time, if not more, we're doing back and forth with the arborist to clarify something. Um, so that's what we do now, and I think that's where a bulk of the, um, the fees are coming from. So in terms of moving forward under this ordinance, um, the idea is that if council approves the budget, we would go out um, with an RFP to for one or more on-call arborists um, to be able to basically take over most of the tree-related work, uh, removal permits, pruning permits, um, reviewing tree protection plans, which also adds up quite quickly. Um, those, generally speaking, though, for for new homes are you know passed on to the developer, so that that might not be as big of a concern. Um, but if it's a homeowner who's you know tearing their house down and rebuilding a new one, they they're paying the same amount to have everything looked at by the arborist. Um, and so, in terms of the new fees, we're anticipating it will probably still be a deposit system. Um, unless we figure out a fee to, to kind of get out of that with our, our consultant on fees, but really want it to be just a, you know, the cost of the arborist, that's what's passed on, and that's it, um, with, of course, the smaller technology fees and things like that. Um, so that's what we're envisioning. Um, the council does have a policy in general, not just with this, of full cost, cost um, recovery, and so that is, that is a policy decision they would have to make for this, um, but I think that even without that, the fees will be reduced quite significantly. We're just not sure yet what that will be. Um, so I'm not sure if that completely answered the question or not. Yeah, if I could just build on that for a quick second. The, so the cost of the arborist's work would still have to be reimbursed, but some of the, the reporting would go down 
and some of the staff, the staff review of the arborists reports that work would go away potentially. Yes. Um, but the cost of the arborist is not negligible, right? So, you know, um, I guess, thank you very much for that information, Andrea, because I, I know that fees to those who aren't involved with cities and fees, you might think that it's kind of simple to cut fees. It is not simple to cut fees because, <laughs> as Andrea said, most fees pay for cost recovery. And if you cut them, that's um, that's a policy decision. But the funds to cover the staff costs do have to come from somewhere. And so they have to come from the general fund or they have to come from a different program. It gets redirected and has to be eligible for the use that it's redirected to. So, um, so it's not simple to even do a hardship waiver, um, you know, that that's already an ask. Um, and so anyway, I think to further kind of go down the road of caps that when we don't, when we haven't seen the new, what the new fee schedule is, and then standardization, it, it um, in my experience, fees don't work that way. And literally the, um, um, in my experience, fees are not allowed. For instance, you couldn't do a standardized fee and then accrue a reserve and then spend down the reserve just for, you know, easy for easiness to understand. That's not allowed um, because it's just cost recovery and it can be no more. It should be no less. Right. And so it, it's actually kind of a fine art to, to uh, rejigger fees every year. Um, <laughs> so I guess I wanted to get into this a little bit more and figure out who is paying the fees. Um, so that said, if um, if this motion wants to somehow um, talk about fees that would be charged to the homeowner, um, you know, that we would be that you're interested in still making sure that they are affordable, kind of in a broad way, um, I could get behind something like that. But I think um, uh, saying exactly how that might work gets to be trickier. So those were my thoughts. Or I might suggest that we just uh, uh, dodge it and say we strongly recommend that the city council consider doing that. Let them ask a don't like to do that, but they do have the authority and we don't, but I think we're all in agreement. We, we struggling with the $700 permit. Yeah, that, that may be, um, we don't need to tell the city council how to achieve, but we can convey what our concern is and ask them to yes. address that. I think that's also what vice chair Clements was suggesting. And that may be a more palatable, um, yeah. I mean, in any case, they just listen to us uh, or not as they please. Um, and so, um, uh, that anyway. yeah, but I think I, I, not only me personally, but from the public comment that we've received, uh, we've received quite a few comments now and in the, in this prior study session about concern with the fees and the potential negative impact. And so, um, I want to make sure and we make sure that everything is done that's possible to keep the the processes as efficient as possible, so that the fees are as efficient as possible, as low as possible. So, um, so maybe we could have a um, and maybe I will withdraw my earlier motion and um, and swap in a um, a new one. Can I do that? Um, thank you. Um, it, which would be um, that the um, that the planning commission recommends that the city council um, emphasize process efficiencies to keep fees to homeowners as low as possible, um, something like that. Um, and that that's kind of candidate language. I don't know if there's room for improvement. If somebody has a thought how to improve that, I would um, welcome that thought before we turn it into a an actual motion. Well, I think that that works. Yeah, with the objective of keeping fees to homeowners um, as low as possible. That's a good motion. That's okay. a good objective. I would second that motion. Okay, we'll consider that my motion. And I think that was a second. 
Yeah, additional discussion on that? Hearing none, let's have a roll call. Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. Good idea, Chair. Thank you. That was a good idea. Yeah. Okay, good. Let's move on in our agenda to the item eight reports, correspondence, and general information. So, starting with report on recent city council actions. Do we have a report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Roof. Um, and I'll also note that Lisa Forrest sent an email um, earlier today to the commission. So, some of these will be repeats, um, but I would like to, to say them again. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a, a, few, a few actions by council um, at the past meeting on the 14th. Uh, the council adopted its strategic goals and objectives for 2022 calendar year. Um, and those were emailed to you as an attachment. So you should have those available. Um, they also reappointed planning commissioner Garvey for another three-year term uh, through 20, June, 2025. Excited about that. Um, and then uh, the council also voted to extend the closure of the 700 block of Laurel uh, through September 15th, 2023. So that uh, program has been extended as well. And that is it for council actions. Thank you. Are there planning commission comments or reports? Um, I have a report. I, I would like to um, congratulate Commissioner Garvey on her reappointment. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I would like to second that. And uh, uh, this is Women's Month. And behind every successful man stands a, an astonished woman. But he got it. Okay, and I'll, I'll echo. It's a joke, but it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll echo, echo the congratulations. To, uh, Thanks, to everybody. Sure. I'm looking forward Harvey. to the next th three years. Thank you very much. Any additional planning commission reports or comments? Let's move on to correspondence. Andrea, do we have correspondence? Um, nothing in addition to what's been mentioned in, in conjunction with the pro project this evening. Okay. Let's move on to planning staff comments, reports, and updates of current projects. Sure. Uh, so just a few things. The next City of Good Living newsletter will be sent to residents in early April. Um, there will be quite a few planning topics in there, including SB9 information, um, a new uh, plan for the Northeast industrial area within the city, um, and also our new objective design and development standards process. Um, and the, that process is for single unit, multi-unit and mixed use projects. Um, that, that project just uh, started within the last week, uh, and we will be announcing very soon a workshop. I believe it'll be the first week of May. Um, for the public uh, to provide comments on objective design standards. Um, so all of that information um, will be included in the next newsletter. The uh, composition of the DTAC, which is the Downtown Advisory Committee, um, for the upcoming plan will be decided by City Council on April 11th. The draft land use and housing elements um, and any zoning changes associated with those um, are anticipated to be presented to the Planning Commission at a study, se study session on May 16th. And then um, for immediate items, the next regular meeting will be Monday, April 4th. Um, we are anticipating a mill batch contract for historic preservation um, at 300 Chestnut um, and possibly uh, minor updates to the ADU ordinance. Uh, that will either be going on April 4th or on April 18th, um, and we should know that within the next day or two. And that is it for that item. Andrea, I'm sorry, what was the study session on May 16th about? Uh, the draft land use and housing elements. Oh, got it. As well as any zoning changes as a result of those. Okay. Yeah. So, that so what Lisa there. had mentioned earlier. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And with that, we can adjourn our planning commission meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, all. Chair. Good meeting. Good job, yeah, good meeting. Chair. Thank you, staff. Thanks, Andrea. Good job.
Thank you. Congratulations, Rusha. Lots of work, right? Yeah. Thanks, Rusha. Good job. Really. Thank you.